eating bugs, or entomophagy, if you prefer. It's been talked about a lot the past few years, but it seems that whenever it is, it's in the context of some anti-world economic forum Klaus Schwab hating tirade. You will eat the bugs, and you will own the nothing. <laughs> and I understand why people feel emotional about this. It's natural to feel a personal and cultural connection to your food, and to react negatively when people say they want to take it away. What I'd like to do is bring that conversation down to earth a little bit, to evaluate the actual feasibility of making such a large-scale change to our global food production systems, and to show you without appeal to emotion or conspiracy that eating bugs just doesn't make any sense. Now let's make it clear from the start. This is not a video defending the current food system, which has many problems, nor is it a video which aims to ignore the pollution that modernity has brought to the world, which, as a lover of nature, upsets me dearly. Rather, it's a critique of the idea that by changing just one part of our food system, swapping meat for insects in this case, we can magically solve all of its problems, when in reality it's not any one particular animal that is unsustainable. It's the entirety of the system itself. This is the main takeaway that I want to impress upon you throughout the video that, aside from their frankly unpleasant nature, insects are a false savior. What we've been told about their main selling point, that they're more eco-friendly, is simply not true. Rather than being a fix to our current unsustainable agricultural systems, they are simply, if raised in the exact same way, a continuation of it, with all of its attendant pollution and soil depletion. I will note, though, that bug farming is not entirely a loss. In fact, it has immense potential and has actually already been proven effective by several companies. But these insects aren't being grown to be fed to humans, they're being grown for conventional farm animals like chickens and fish. Several different groups all around the world are using insects in their natural role of the cleanup crew in order to break down food waste, upcycling it into usable protein instead of letting it rot in a landfill where it will produce methane. We'll discuss much more about these companies later, but for now, let's look at the bug question as it has been presented to us. The discussion surrounding human edible insects got started in earnest in 2012 at a conference held by the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization, the FAO. Out of this conference came a report in 2013 titled Edible Insects, Future Prospects for Food and Feed Security, which I will link in the video description. Ever since this report was published, edible bugs have been a favorite subject of almost every major news organization, and they've managed to plant the idea in the mind of your average person that we practically have no choice but to eat bugs in the future. Here in London, eating insects isn't really a thing, but soon we might not have a choice. What exactly are the arguments that are leading them to think this way? Well, the biggest benefit to eating bugs is said to be their eco-friendly nature, and this comes down to four main factors. Number one, Reduced greenhouse gas emissions as compared to conventional farm animals, especially ruminants. Number two, reduced feed requirements. Number three, reduced water requirements. And number four, insects take up less land, especially as compared to grazing animals who need access to at least an acre or two ahead. So let's examine each of these claims in turn and see how true they are. Beginning with greenhouse gas emissions. Let's examine how much is emitted by conventional livestock first. According to the FAO in their research paper titled Livestock's Long Shadow, Livestock are responsible for up to 18% of anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions, consisting of 9% of all CO2 emissions and 35-40% to of all methane emissions. However, this number was later admitted by the author to be an overestimate, and a more recent FAO publication put the figure at 14.5%. That is, 14.5% of all of the world's greenhouse gas emissions come from the livestock sector when considered as a whole, including transportation, infrastructure, energy use, and of course from the animals themselves. Now on the other, more pro-cattle side of the aisle, people will point out that in many countries, the percentage is far lower than that. In the US, for example, livestock account for around 4% of greenhouse gas emissions. Now this is due partly to the fact that we have so many other greenhouse gas emitting industries, but also because our cows produce dairy and meat far more efficiently than in other countries, and therefore produce fewer emissions. But whatever the case may be, it is clear that livestock, and in particular ruminants who are unique in their production of large quantities of methane, are a relevant source of greenhouse gases. Now insects, by comparison, produce just a fraction of their emissions. In this 2010 study by researchers out of Wageningen University in the Netherlands, the Akata domesticus cricket produced around 1.5 kilograms of CO2 for every kilogram of body mass gained. This as compared to beef cattle at around 2.8 kilograms, an almost 50% difference. This difference has mostly to do with the insect's metabolism. Because they are cold-blooded animals and can't produce body heat, they don't use any energy to keep their bodies warm like mammals do. So this energy can be more efficiently used to grow the insect's body. But the differences are actually even more stark than just this 50% CO2 difference. Because ruminants produce more potent greenhouse gases such as methane and nitrous oxide in addition to CO2, if we reckon these animals' greenhouse gas figures in terms of CO2 equivalent gases, that is, we look at the greenhouse effect potential of the gases, 
then cows produce almost 1,400 times as much as crickets. Additionally, these greenhouse gas measurements were given in terms of the live body weight of the animals. When all is said and done, by weight, only around 40% of a cow's body is actually edible, whereas all of an insect's body is edible, and 80% of that is digestible, the rest seemingly acting as fiber. This multiplies the efficiency even further, because more than half of a cow is going to end up as byproducts, whereas 100% of a cricket is directly edible by humans. Now, at first glance, this argument seems pretty convincing, and I'm not even going to deny any of these figures, as they are all pretty much accurate. What I'd like to do instead is examine what they mean, and question if they're really a cause for alarm. Let's ask ourselves this. If we were to eat bugs, how much would it actually help the environment? Let's look first at the potential impacts on CO2. Going back to the wagon and study discussed above, where crickets produced half the CO2 of cows. And that sounds great. But if we were to compare this to a more efficient animal, say a chicken raised for its meat, then the CO2 levels become nearly identical. And this finding has been reproduced in several studies too. Take this 2015 study by Mark Lundy and Michael Perel which sought to determine how efficiently crickets could convert various feeds into protein. This metric is important when considering CO2 because the largest impact that any farm animal has on its environment is generally going to come from the food being grown for it. Now, in this study, one group of crickets raised on a diet of commercial animal feed had an almost identical protein conversion efficiency as industrially farmed chickens. In other words, they turned the protein in the feed into animal protein just as efficiently as chickens. This means that to produce a given amount of protein, crickets will consume the same amount of food and are therefore no more green in this regard than something that we already have all the infrastructure to raise, an animal we have been living with for thousands of years. Look too at this 2012 study, which found nearly identical food conversion ratios for chicken and mealworms. Food conversion ratio differs slightly from protein conversion efficiency in that it measures only the weight of the food versus the weight of the harvested animals, but the conclusion is the same insects are no more efficient. In addition to the amount of feed being exactly the same or worse than existing farm animals, insect production considered as a whole will potentially produce more greenhouse gases as compared to chickens. This is because again, insects are cold-blooded, so their enclosures need to be climate controlled much more strictly to optimize their growth as compared to warm-blooded animals who can tolerate some temperature differences. And other studies have corroborated this energy finding as well, like that mealworm study just cited above. All of these findings led Lundy and Perel to conclude in their study that, quote, even if global demand for crickets were to exist at a much greater scale than it does at present, a novel protein source with a little or no protein conversion efficiency improvement compared to chicken is unlikely to justify the investments required to produce crickets at a scale of global significance. Now, you may think this is all irrelevant because these bugs were eating animal feed which is basically human-grade food like corn, rice, flax, and soybeans. We shouldn't be feeding crickets human edible food anyhow. But the reality is, oftentimes, producers are forced to. Firstly, by simple economics. There is a reason why commercial farmers feed their chickens this feed. It's cheap, it grows animals quickly, it's easy to source, and there's very little risk of disease as compared to things like human food waste. Additionally, according to the FAO, insects intended for human consumption need to be fed human-grade feed because their whole body, including the equivalent of their guts, is eaten. If they were to be fed post-consumer food waste, or manure, they would likely harbor all sorts of pathogens and could not be sold to people. And we see this fact being played out in almost all commercial bug production facilities, almost all of which feed their insects corn, wheat, rice, flax, and soybeans, just like what chickens and pigs eat. In the rare cases where growers advertise that their insects consume byproducts, it's usually high-quality feed like cornmeal or distiller's grain, which would normally be fed to farm animals. But these are far and away the exception anyhow. No matter where you look, it seems that farmed insects are being raised on high-quality human edible food. Yeah, yeah, so, to eat. yeah so that is the intercube uh, uh, proprietary feed. Mm -hmm. So we've developed it ourselves. It's grain-based, the vitamins are optimized, protein optimized. This is their food on top. So what we do is it's really like a powder. Um, we grind down organic chicken feed. All of this casts serious doubts on what we've been sold about these animals being so eco-friendly. Now moving on to methane production. Many insects, including the Acada domesticus, don't produce any methane at all. And this is going to account for almost all of the vast difference in the greenhouse gas emissions between bugs and cattle. To put the size of the problem into perspective, a cow produces on average 5.3 tons of CO2 equivalent gas a year, and your typical passenger vehicle produces around 4.6. There were 275 million registered vehicles in the US as of 2020, and around 90 million cattle. So they really do produce quite a lot of greenhouse gases. Now before I go any further, 
Again, know that I am not an apologist for cattle or the cattle industry. It does have several large problems and no qualms about spending tons of money to make the public ignore them. However, there are a few things that can be said that can temper the simplified and easy to digest anti-cow argument that's so popular these days. Firstly, and vegans will hate this one, it is absolutely relevant that the methane which cows produce is part of a natural cycle. In short, the cows ingest plant matter, bacteria in their guts turn it into methane, which around 12 years later will be broken down into CO2, which can then be reabsorbed by new plant growth. This means that if the ruminant population does not increase, then levels of methane will not increase either. And looking at the numbers, it seems that the world cattle herd isn't increasing. Looking first at just the West, according to the USDA, there are approximately 92 million cows in the US, down from a high of 130 million in 1976. But even with this reduction in numbers, it still seems like quite a lot. But it's actually comparable to how many large ruminants used to live in North America pre-settlement. Estimates vary on this, but according to some, the North American continent was home to 60 million bison, 45 million antelope, 40 million white-tailed deer, 10 million mule deer, 10 million elk, 2 million bighorn sheep, and a million moose. All of these animals are ruminants, who produce large quantities of methane as a natural byproduct of their digestion. This is to say that in all likelihood, we have a not too dissimilar number of large ruminants producing a not too dissimilar amount of methane as compared to before the Industrial Revolution. This also isn't to mention the 26 million elephants, which were estimated to have been alive in Africa at the end of the 18th century, as compared to the only around 400,000 alive today. And the same population decline has sadly been seen in countless other large ruminants. I couldn't find reliable estimates for how high many of these animal populations used to be, since many are in Africa and the funding just isn't there. But if their population decline is anywhere near as severe as that of the African elephant, this means that hundreds of millions of ruminants have been lost over the centuries. I will include in the video description estimates for the declines of various wild ruminant populations, along with the sources you can check out yourself. And alongside the drastic decline in the number of ruminants on the planet, the livestock population has remained pretty much stagnant. According to the USDA, the number of cattle alive in the world has not changed drastically in the past 50 years, having been at around 1 billion heads since 1975. If this is correct, then the increasing concentrations of methane in the atmosphere, as reported by NOAA, cannot be due to livestock and must be caused by other human activity or natural processes. To be fair though, the UN does estimate that rather than remaining stagnant, the world cattle population has actually increased significantly over the past few decades, going from around 1 billion head to 1.5 billion, most of this increase coming from Africa and Asia. Now it's unclear to me why these estimates differ so drastically, but even if we assume that the 1.5 billion figure of the UN's is more accurate than the USDA's, the devastation of the wild ruminant populations over the centuries still more than make up for this increase in methane production. Production. So I know this is a controversial opinion, but I maintain that methane alone is not an issue. Not when it's a part of a natural cycle of the planet produced by a stable population of ruminants. Now, technically, yes, if we reduce the number of ruminants on the planet, we would expect the methane levels in the atmosphere to drop, reducing the strength of the Earth's greenhouse effect. However, since animal sources of methane are likely at the same or even lower levels than they were in the past, it's unreasonable to look to animal sources of methane as the problem. Any problem that we have clearly has more to do with humans consuming fossil fuels and introducing new carbon into the atmosphere. By way of analogy, it would be as if you had 10 people living in a house all of their lives, and then all of a sudden, 100 other people move into the house and they start complaining that, well, it wouldn't be so crowded if those 10 people would just move out. The fact of the matter is that all pollution, not just atmospheric carbon, but also plastic waste, industrial runoff, acidified ocean, biome destruction, are all due to a rapidly and perhaps irresponsibly increasing human population. The population of Africa alone has increased five times since the end of World War II, and the per capita resource consumption has also increased in that time. To suddenly blame livestock for this problem, which is obviously one of irresponsible resource consumption on the part of humans, is absurd. If we eliminate livestock, then sure, methane levels will go down and we will have bought ourselves some time. But the underlying issues would still exist. This holy grail attitude towards this one element of our food production system, in this case cows, is the exact same attitude which scientists have towards eating insects. Again, let it be crystal clear that I am not denying that reducing cattle populations would not yield short-term benefits. I'm simply saying that to do so would eliminate greenhouse gases that have always existed, and only so that we can burn coal for another decade or so before we get back to the same levels that we're at today we must treat root causes. Now, a lot of you will still disagree with me that the natural methane cycle is relevant here. And like, it's fine, I get it. It's probably my most controversial opinion in this video. You could easily argue that it doesn't matter where the methane comes from, whether it's from a cow or a natural gas leak, it'll still have the same greenhouse effect. And you know what? I say that's fair enough. 
Ultimately, this whole thing sort of comes down to a philosophical disagreement. In that case, I would just point to the fact that chickens produce about 542 times less methane than cows. So that's basically problem solved right there. So now moving on, looking at just the CO2 and the methane produced by these animals doesn't really tell the entire environmental story. Firstly, as mentioned above, doing so doesn't account for the greenhouse gas emissions of the farm and raising crickets tends to be more energy intensive as compared to chickens. But also, it fails to account for all the byproducts that we get from these animals. We derive from cows alone things like leather, cosmetics, chemicals, several edible parts like organ meats, tongue and brain, which usually aren't counted as part of the cow's meat, horn, hoofs, sutures for use in surgery, hair, and, and dozens of other materials used in all sorts of niche applications. No part of the animal is ever wasted. Meanwhile, what we get from bugs is bugs either whole or powderized. There are comparatively very few byproducts that we get from the body of a cricket. And when people are arguing how eco-friendly they are, they don't take into account the impact of producing all of these other materials, which we will suddenly need replacements for, which we will suddenly need factories to produce instead of the organic factories which produce them for us now. Producing pleather in synthesized chemicals has an environmental impact. And if we're trying to make a fair comparison, they need to be taken into account rather than only comparing the grams of protein that each animal produces. And while we're on the subject of bugs not producing enough of something, let's talk about fertilizer. Now this is a bit of my own original research, and understand that I'm not totally equipped to get to the bottom of this question myself. But I include this section anyhow so that maybe somebody who is better equipped can expand upon it. Now, as I've said, insects, or chickens for that matter, are far more efficient with their feed as compared to cows. Because of this, they produce far less waste over their lifetimes, which means far less fertilizer. To be clear, insects do produce waste called frass, which is a mixture of feces, shed exoskeletons, dead insects, and uneaten feed, which can be used as a fertilizer. But the amount produced is always going to be much less as compared to cows. Doing some very rough napkin math, again, I'm under no illusions that this is definitive, we're told in a video by Darren Golden of Entomo Farms that a full harvest of one of his barns produces approximately 2,500 pounds of crickets and 2,000 pounds of frass. Yeah, so that uh, we call frass, and that's actually the word for cricket manure. And each room when we harvest, we'll get about 2,500 pounds of crickets and about 2,000 pounds of uh, cricket manure. Using these numbers and numbers from a study done on farm animal manure at Utah State University, we can calculate how much dry manure is produced for unit of protein. I won't bore you with the math, but look in the video description if you want to see how I arrived at my numbers. The conclusion I came to is that for every pound of protein produced by a cow, we should expect 110 pounds of dry weight fertilizer. For every pound of protein produced by a cricket, we should expect 1.33 pounds of fertilizer. This is a difference of 8,300%. Since human protein demand is unlikely to increase 8,300%, this means that in theory, were we to replace all beef with crickets, the world would face a massive shortfall in the amount of natural fertilizer it has available. As it stands, 50% of the world's crops are grown using natural fertilizer. So our dependence on synthetic fertilizers, which are made from fossil fuels, usually natural gas, would need to increase. Now, in the U.S., this isn't exactly the case, since, according to the USDA, only around 5% of crops use manure as fertilizer anyhow, probably because using synthetics is much easier and usually cheaper. But if we want to farm in a more holistic, regenerative way, we should be moving towards an increased, responsible use of natural fertilizers rather than away from it entirely. With synthetic fertilizers comes increased runoff, increased soil compaction, decreased ability of the soil to hold water, a lessened carbon sequestration ability of the soil, and overall poor soil health due to the depletion of organic material and microbial life. Additionally, the production of synthetic fertilizers is very energy intensive. According to the FAO, synthetic nitrogen fertilizers are responsible for around 2.4% of total global emissions. They're responsible for a full 7% of China's greenhouse gas emissions alone, mostly due to the fact that they use coal rather than the cleaner natural gas to produce their fertilizer. Now, I understand there is a lot of nuance here. Some people think that synthetic fertilizers are totally fine, and they have their reasons. Again, I'm not claiming to be an expert in this regard. I just want to stress that when looked at as a whole, the estimated 83 times reduction in natural fertilizer production would have to lead to an increased reliance on chemical fertilizers derived from fossil fuels if we all start eating bugs. Now, moving on to the feed argument. Many will argue that insects are more environmentally friendly because they require less feed than conventional farm animals. But as we've already seen, they consume almost exactly the same amount as chickens, which we already have all the infrastructure and the know-how to raise. So there aren't any direct feed savings to be had with bugs, but there are many other feed considerations. For instance, what if we could use insects to consume waste? About one third of all the food produced worldwide is wasted, and a lot of that ends up in landfills 
where it anaerobically rots and produces CO2 and methane. Many species of insects, most notably the black soldier fly, could consume this waste, upcycling the nutrients in it into high-quality, usable protein. This is actually a phenomenal idea and has already been put into practice by a number of companies, including Chapul Farms in the US. Check out this interview I did with their CCO, Ali Moore, for more details on them and farmed insects generally. Do note, however, that if bugs are raised on this post-consumer waste, they are not considered safe to eat by humans, as per UN recommendations and a multitude of laws, for fear of contamination and infection. What these bugs are great for, and what they're currently being used for, is a feed for other farm animals, most notably chicken and fish. This not only reduces landfill usage and methane production, but also reduces what we need to grow for livestock in the first place, and produces a healthier option than soybeans for these animals, which naturally eat insects anyhow. Now, obviously, the ideal solution would be to not produce this food waste in the first place. And because of that, I think there is a slight moral hazard in setting up industries of waste-consuming insects. If we ever did eventually reach the ideal state of no food waste, then all these companies would be forced to either close their doors or, much more likely because they've already invested in all the infrastructure, return to feeding them human edible food. So this is a slight risk, but frankly, we toss out so much food that it's unlikely to be a problem anytime soon. And by the way, while we're talking about farm animals consuming waste, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that cattle play a hugely important role as waste consumers in our agricultural system. In terms of weight, the majority, over 70% of what comes out of a farmer's field, is actually byproducts like straw and stalks. And the vast majority of this gets fed to cattle, who upcycle the nutrients in it that are unavailable to practically any other animal, including insects, and make them available to us in the forms of meat and dairy. In fact, these crop residues, in addition to just plain old grass, things which humans cannot eat, account for the vast majority, over 90% of what cows in the U.S. eat. Now this is sort of a crazy finding, so follow me here. A 2017 study examined how much human edible food is required to produce a kilogram of meat in various animals, and determined that cows in the U.S. actually consume about 13% less human edible food as compared to monogastrics like chickens. And because we know that chickens consume the same amount of feed as crickets, this means that we should expect a cow to consume less human edible food per pound of protein produced as compared to crickets. Meaning that in a way, cows are more efficient than insects. And by the way, on regenerative farms where cows consume nothing but grass, this technically means they're infinitely more efficient than crickets. It turns out cows actually have a lot of upside, which is probably why we keep so many millions of them around. But to sum up this discussion on feed, insects, again, consume no less feed than chickens which means there is no incentive to switch to farming them. There is, however, I believe, a massive incentive to set up waste-consuming insect facilities. So ideally, in the future, I actually do hope to see the country dotted with insect farms. It's just that these bugs won't be destined for human consumption. The next important environmental consideration is bugs' reduced water consumption. If you compare your average insect to cows, for instance, they consume almost five times less water per gram of protein produced. And this is an important consideration especially in agricultural areas which are depleting their aquifers, like in California in the Midwestern U.S. Now, there is the rub that if what these animals are consuming is what's called green water, basically rainwater, then it has pretty much no negative environmental impact. And it's worth noting that many regenerative farms today consume nothing but green water. So, increased water consumption isn't bad per se, but it can be. But regardless, let's tackle the issue. Now, right away, the idea that insects consume any less water than, say, the chickens that I keep defending fails for the exact same reasons we've already discussed. The vast majority, over 99%, of the water consumed by an animal goes into the crops that it eats. And again, chickens and bugs eat the exact same amount of food, so their water consumption is practically identical. Now that being said, you will still often hear claims that insects consume less water, and you'll see charts like this making that claim. How exactly are they getting these figures? Well, we can figure that out by looking at this 2015 study titled Mealworms for Food, a Water Footprint Perspective. In this study, Researchers looked into the water efficiency of mealworms and found out that per edible ton of insect produced, the water consumed is nearly identical as two chickens at 4,341 and 4,325 cubic meters respectively. But if you look at it in terms of what they call edible protein, then insects consume about 30% less water than chickens. Now, this doesn't mean that the insects actually produced any more protein with the same amount of feed in water. What it means is that they are counting the entire insect because it's usually eaten whole, whereas for the chicken, they're only counting the carcass weight. They're disregarding things like the head, the neck, the organs, and the feet, all of which account for about 
30% of the weight of the bird. And all of these things are edible, by the way. They're usually just used for pet or animal feed. If you were to include all these parts, then we should expect the amount of protein produced per unit of water to be identical for chickens and crickets. So if we really, really wanted our chicken to be just as water efficient as crickets, well, we could start making a habit of eating chicken neck and feet. But then this doesn't take into account what we would have to do to produce the protein for pet and animal feed that these chicken byproducts are usually used for. The trick that these studies play in order to make it seem that crickets are way more efficient than chickens is just to throw away a huge part of the body of a chicken and pretend that we don't do anything with it, we just let it rot in a pile. When in reality, no part of an animal is ever wasted in agriculture. That protein from the chicken is used, meaning it is just as efficient as crickets. Now let's move on to discuss space savings. Insects inherently require a lot less space than big animals, and they can be farmed in multi-level buildings, further multiplying the space efficiency. Now, this is an important consideration and can be a benefit to the environment, but only if the way that we're using the land is irresponsible which as of right now pretty much is the case. Much of the agricultural land in the U.S. is being used for intensive monocropped agriculture, fertilized with synthetic petrochemicals which, as mentioned above, deplete the natural fertility of the soil. If we could reduce the land required for our farm animals, then we could preserve some of it instead of letting it all become depleted. So, in come bugs. But in this way too, bugs end up feeling like a false savior. While the actual barns that the bugs are raised in will have a much smaller footprint than barns for even my beloved chicken, the vast majority of the land that is required to raise an animal, again, comes from the feed that is grown for it which as I've said ad nauseum is identical for chickens and insects. So we shouldn't expect any real advantage in this regard. And speaking more broadly, the fact that our current agricultural system is harming the land isn't an argument for why we should reduce our usage of it, but for why we should completely reevaluate how we use it. When done correctly, animal agriculture has the potential to not only not harm the land, but actually improve it. Many regenerative practices have seen a rise in popularity in the past decade, and these actually improve the soil fertility and its ability to sequester carbon from the atmosphere. The solution to the problem of dead soil isn't to slightly reduce the rate at which we're killing it, which is what introducing insect farming would do. Rather, the solution is to totally change the system from the ground up. And further undermining the relevancy of the space-saving argument is the question, what do we plan to do with the unused land? If we theoretically got rid of the biggest land users, cattle, for instance. Well, by far the most common response to this question would be rewild it, let the land return to its natural state pre-settlement. The problem is that the vast majority of the grassland we used to graze cattle on was grasslands pre-settlement, and in its natural state, the state that it needs to be in to survive, is filled with ruminants, namely bison in the US. If we rewilded the Midwest, we would have to introduce tens of millions of bison, who eat grass and burnt methane just like cows in order to ensure the landscape's continued health. And in the process, we will have accomplished nothing other than reducing food security because we'll no longer have any beef. Reducing the amount of land that we have under intensive, destructive monocropped agriculture is vitally important. But number one, chickens already use about the same amount of land as insects. And number two, it doesn't need to be the case that agriculture is destructive. Overall, scientific research suggests that we should expect only a very moderate decrease, or potentially even an increase, in the environmental impact of insect farming as compared to conventional animals like chicken, such that the immense cost and time needed to change over our entire food production system won't be justified or even reasonable. And this is before we even consider the challenges, both known and unknown, that will come with such a massive paradigm shift, and the shortfall in fertilizer which will lead to an increased reliance on petrochemical fertilizers. Now, all that being said, it is still vital that insects play a role in our agricultural system. Ideally, this role would be played out in the field, as it always was historically, with insects breaking down waste and making nutrients available to the soil and other animals. But so long as we're going to be farming livestock and crops at an industrial scale, then I think it makes sense to also farm insects at a comparable industrial scale, so that we may reap the benefits that they naturally provide for us. Instead of doing what farmers have been doing for the past 70 years and viewing insects primarily as pests to be eliminated with poisons. Initiatives that seek to reintroduce insects to our agricultural system are already underway, such as Chapul Farms, which I mentioned above, but also the Ecodiptera project, which uses the black soldier fly to break down pig manure, transforming a difficult to use waste product into a much higher quality fertilizer. And further work on food waste reduction is being done by companies like AgriProtein and Enviroflight. So while insect farming should be practiced more broadly in the future, and we stand to benefit immensely from it, in terms of feeding these insects directly to humans, it just doesn't make any sense. So the practical considerations should lead us to believe that farming insects for human consumption is simply not viable. But what if, for one reason or another, human edible insect farms do become a reality in the future. Perhaps they discover some superbug that can turn air into protein. 
would there be any good reason to not switch over to eating exclusively this bug? Well, potentially. To begin, there are a whole host of difficulties which eating bugs would present, which many haven't considered. First, there would be a risk in implementing a diet that nobody on the planet has ever eaten anything like before. While it is true that around 2 billion people regularly eat bugs as a part of their diet, the way they eat bugs is completely different from how it would be in the West. First of all, almost all of these bugs are harvested from the wild, and they actually eat very few of them getting on average only around 2% of their total protein from bug sources. In this small amount, only when their preferred sources like meat are scarce. If Westerners were to eat such little bug protein, then any supposed impact on their carbon footprint would be so small as to be immeasurable. People would be required to get a large percentage or potentially the majority of their protein from insect sources if we really want to move the needle. And the potential health effects of this are completely unknown. Especially in a population that has zero history of entomophagy, the results could be devastating. Secondly, bugs have the potential to harbor all sorts of things that we don't want going into our bodies. For one, potentially communicable diseases and very communicable fungal infections are commonly found in all sorts of insects. Unethical farmers could easily give their insects any and a variety of feeds that would greatly increase the risk of disease or infection, including feces, animal corpses, or moldy meat. Depending on these species of insect, they will gladly eat these sorts of things. This may sound theoretical, but one study actually found these exact scenarios to have been playing out in insect farms they examined. In fact, the researchers found that of the 300 farms they visited, 244 contained insects with parasitic infections, and in 90 of these cases, the parasites were parasitic to humans. Now, in rebuttal, you may want to argue that conventional farm animals could be raised unethically as well. And yes, unethical farmers always have and always will exist. But at the very least, with poultry and mammals, we don't consume them whole so we're not eating their guts. For another concern, since bugs are usually eaten whole, they are far more susceptible to chemical contamination as compared to mammals and birds, who have their skin and guts removed. And lastly, although I found no research looking into this issue, I would be concerned about the levels of plastic which end up either on or inside of these insects' bodies, given that many of them live their whole lives in plastic bins. For another issue, one which the scientific perspective seems to always miss but is really important, consider that People don't like to eat bugs. For whatever reason, maybe because they're pests, they're indications of filth, many are dangerous, people all around the world have a natural aversion to bugs of all sorts. While it's not impossible that people could be forced to get over this, especially if they're raised with them, we should really ask ourselves the question, is it ethical to force people to eat something that they find repulsive? Sure, you could perhaps slowly convince them over time, but frankly, this sounds even less ethical. And beyond just forcing people to eat something that they find gross, it would destroy the food culture of the West, which has always had animal meat as an important centerpiece. A centerpiece that you were practically forced to share with your community. You can't exactly slaughter a cow and then eat the whole thing. Bugs, however, are perfectly enjoyable alone. Even the staunchest advocate of entomophagy has to admit that the West has no history of eating bugs, and they certainly have never been farmed. Moving to such a model would utterly destroy this part of our culture. And another important point on food culture, Think of all the amazing things that you can create with just one cow. A huge variety of cuts, roasts, steaks, organ meat. The products that we can create with these things like sausages. Not to mention hundreds of dairy products, all of which have a deep history and connection to us. Meanwhile, what you get from crickets is crickets. Nothing else. Now, people will argue that you could blend the crickets into a flour and then put this in all sorts of things like breads, muffins, and drinks. But first off, adding bugs to a pre-existing food doesn't make it a new food. Secondly, isn't it a bit of a red flag that the best thing you can do to make insects appetizing is to hide them in other foods? And lastly, you could blend up any food that you want and add it to a pre-existing food. This isn't something that's unique to bugs. Like, if you wanted to, you could freeze-dry a piece of steak, turn it into a powder, and then add that to your drinks. The problem is, nobody would do that because steak is good. Simply put, Widespread insect farming would do irreparable harm to the food traditions of a people, all in the name of sustainability, despite the fact that these same traditions sustained us for untold millennia. So to wrap things up here, we won't be eating bugs in the future. Their main benefit, that they are supposedly more environmentally friendly, hasn't been borne out by the research. This, along with their pathogen risk, their low levels of fertilizer production, and the frankly unpleasant dining experience that they will provide, all make the idea of widespread entomophagy ridiculous. And if you haven't been convinced by any of my arguments thus far, well, you can know that we're probably not going to eat bugs just because of inertia. The cultural inertia of our food and habits, but also the fact that we have billions of dollars of infrastructure to facilitate the production of protein from cows, but not for insects. If there's a problem with cow farming, economically it will always make more sense to fix what we have, rather than to rehaul the entire food system from the ground up putting our food security at great risk in the meantime. We are way more likely to start feeding cows seaweed that reduces their methane production, or to put these stupid masks over their noses to catch their burps 
than to create a ground up new agricultural system. And maybe we'll get far enough with these patchwork solutions that someday we won't even be concerned with the greenhouse gas emissions from cattle. By 2040, the UK, for instance, plans to have a completely carbon neutral agricultural system. So hopefully they'll make some progress there. The fact of the matter is that the future food system is far more likely to resemble today's regenerative farms than an insect farm. Either that or we'll all be vegans. Yeah, that's right. I didn't forget about you vegans. They have a pretty strong argument here. I mean, why spend billions of dollars to switch to an unproven and likely not that much better way to get protein when we could all just eat plants? It would produce far fewer greenhouse gas emissions than any livestock, and we wouldn't have to kill millions of animals a year. Whether the world going vegan is viable or not is not something I'm prepared to discuss here. But you have to admit it's a much more likely scenario than widespread insect farming. But here's a question that remains in all of this. If eating bugs is such a ridiculous prospect, then why is their farming still being pushed so hard? The edible insect industry is regularly receiving millions of dollars from the likes of Mark Cuban and Ariel Zuckerberg. That's Mark Zuckerberg's sister, by the way. Frankly, I do not have an answer to this one. My only guesses are that, number one, it's just surviving based on marketing hype and investors will put their money anywhere these days. Or number two, maybe they're being pushed because insects will be so cheap to produce. Once at scale, we should expect insect production to be much cheaper than conventional farm animals, given their low land requirement, the fact that you can have these production facilities closer to cities than cattle, and importantly, bugs require almost no labor. If the dream of the insect farmers can be achieved, then these insects will be raised almost entirely by robots, eliminating the need to pay workers. Really though, the answer as to why bugs are being pushed so hard is still kind of a mystery. Let me know your ideas in a comment. Thank you all so much for watching my video. Have a nice day. Hey everyone, here is my quick plug to let you know that I've launched a Subscribestar account. Any help that I get through that will all go right towards making the videos better and hopefully allow me to spend more time making them. I put the link right at the top of the video description, so check it out there. Anyone who signs up will get early access to my videos, as well as video transcripts if you prefer to read them, as well as the ability to message me through the platform if you'd like. Any help is greatly appreciated, and it will enable me to do as much good as possible with this little YouTube channel. So, thank you all very much. V, you will eat the bugs. You will eat the bugs. No, I'll never eat bugs. Nobody will ever eat bugs. That's right. Let's promise. Let's shake on it. You're never going to eat bugs. Say no to the communist control freak dehumanizers. Yeah, never. Yeah. 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 Waiter, there's a fly in my soup. Could you do something about it? There is a fly in your soup in yeah. this establishment? Yeah. I shall do something about it instantaneously, sir. Yes, sir, a fly in your soup. Can you guess what we're gonna make? That's right. We are gonna make a soup. A cricket miso soup.